So I'd like to uh, ask you, Rashid Khalidi, uh, your professor at uh, Columbia University, Edward Said, uh, uh, chair of Arab Studies there. What are some of the concerns that you have uh, about Donald Trump, uh, were he to become president, when it comes to, to, for example, Iraq, Syria, ISIS? I mean, I have, I have concerns about both candidates, because I think Trump, first of all, is almost not a real person. Trump is a media creation. He's a, he's a Barnum and Bailey creation. Les Moonves, the head of CBS, called him uh, something in a circus. And by the way, it was, it was the corporate media that created Trump, that created this. Uh, Moonves said to an a investment group in California, it may not be good for America, but it's good for CBS. The money's rolling in, and this is fun. This is the head of CBS. Uh, not even the network his show was on. Um, and so what we have is infotainment taking over, celebrity culture taking over, and someone who has, has never, I think, had a serious thought about policy. I don't think he knows anything about the world. It is terrifying to think of him being president, obviously. Uh, it's very uncomfortable to think of someone like Hillary being president in terms of global issues because she's always been interventionist. She's always been a hawk. Uh, she was the person who pushed the hardest for intervention in Libya, and we've seen exactly how poorly that has turned out. And I, one is afraid that she or Trump would enable what I call the war party in Syria, people who would like the United States not just to intervene, but to push things to the point where we may actually end up in both a ground war and a direct military confrontation with Russia. So I'm, I'm very, very concerned. Uh, I'm, I'm also concerned about the Iran deal, deal being reversed by either of these two potential presidents. It may have surprised many to um, wake up on Friday and see the lead editorial in The New York Times at the boiling point with Israel. They write, if the aim of the Israeli government is to prevent a peace deal with the Palestinians now or in the future, it's close to realizing that goal. Last week, it approved the construction of a new Jewish settlement in the West Bank, another step in the steady march under Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to build on land needed to create a Palestinian state. And they go on from there. <clears throat> this right about the time that President Obama had gone to Israel um, for the funeral of Shimon Peres. Right. It's lovely to see The New York Times wake up decades after the fact. Uh, to the uh, reality that has been created by American money and American political support in making a, any kind of resolution along the two state, along two state lines impossible. Um, this is something that, this is a ship that sailed, uh, and it sailed because we cemented in place with billions of dollars a year, and Israeli government after government saw to it that it was well spent, a reality that will be very, very difficult, if not impossible, to change. There's a one-state reality between the River Jordan and the sea. And we are, we, the United States, are largely responsible for that. I, I, I do not foresee either of these two presidential candidates changing that. And this settlement that they are now constructing of, what, 300 homes, the mm -hmm. significance of this in the midst of, what, the largest U.S. military deal in history, $38 billion promised to Israel over the next, next 10 years. Well, they've delivered yet another slap to President Obama. Let's see if he decides to turn the other cheek for the 18th or 20th time. They've done this again and again and again. Um, he has a few months left in office. There are many things that he could do, specifically to, to do with settlements. He could push for a Security Council resolution, which reemphasizes the fact that they're illegal. He could do many things. We'll see what he does. I think that Netanyahu is not terribly afraid of our president. I, I think there's a lot of evidence of that. He's just gotten, as you said, this extraordinary, extraordinary deal, um, $3.8 billion, plus a lot of other, a lot of other goodies embodied in that. And he has no compunction in giving the United States a slap in the face. Well, how do you think Israel-Palestine will be discussed in tonight's debate? You know, it's very hard to think of substance when you've had what we've been listening to for the last half hour on your show and a, fl a flood of things in the rest of the media. My guess is that several dozen serious stories disappeared from the media because of this. Uh, when you have this kind of a person, when you have this kind of a celebrity politician, how can you discuss policy? I wonder, I wonder if they'll be able to get to it. Um, if they do, uh, I'm sure both candidates will compete in out uh, uh, pandering. Uh, to a narrow segment of what they think are supporters of Israel. And your thoughts as a father and grandfather, a teacher of female students, um, on these tapes that have come out? A lot of men say these kinds of things. 
And I'm, I'm actually happy that this has happened because it's not just the Donald Trumps of this world who do this. And I think it's good to have this out there. I think it's good to have this, this, this inflated balloon come crashing down. Uh, I'm, I'm sure it's not going to change our culture. Uh, but this is, this, this is part I get of— The sorry. issue of this is not just saying it, but talking about how he actively assaulted women, whether they wanted it or not. That's how a lot of men talk. And, and that is something repulsive and nauseating. And because he is so foolish as to have had a camera on his lapel when he said it, we now have it out in the public arena. Um, uh, I, I, hope, I hope a lot of people will not just vote against him for this, but will try and do something about the whole way in which masculinity functions in our culture. It has a gender and it has a race element to it, as Professor Crenshaw said okay. earlier. Well, another arms deal uh, that was recently approved by the Senate is a billion-dollar arms sales deal to Saudi Arabia. Right. And just over the weekend, on Saturday, an air raid uh, on a funeral in Yemen killed 140 people and injured over 500. Now, Saudi Arabia has not claimed responsibility for the attack, it's denied, but it's, actually, it's responsibility. denied responsibility, but they've said that they're going to carry out an investigation into how this occurred, while at the same time saying they didn't do it. So what do you think? Um, Simultaneously, there have been claims that uh, Saudi Arabia has been using white phosphorus in mm -hmm. Yemen that's supplied by the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, so could you comment on this entire, uh, what's going on in Yemen, what Saudi Arabia is doing, and what the U.S. Right. role there is? There have been over 4,000 civilian casualties in Yemen, 60 percent of them caused by airstrikes by Saudi Arabia and its partners. We are the ones who sell the planes to the Emirates and Saudi Arabia, and we're the ones who've sold a billion dollars recently in munitions so that they could replenish their stocks and keep bombing. Um, today, another announcement was made. The United States is going to suspend its cooperation with this air campaign. We're not just arming them and giving them munitions. American reconnaissance, intelligence, coordination is involved, I think, also air, in air refueling. So these are, these are Saudi pilots and planes. But again, as with Israel, there are hands holding them up and, and, and pushing them in the direction that they're going. We're